Well, hello there, everyone. How you guys doing? Welcome back to Sin City Crypto. My name is David. I'll be one of your co-hosts. And today, like every day, coming at you live from our studio in Las Vegas, Nevada. We have a jam-packed, exciting show for you today. Coinbase has played their Uno reverse card, and they've thrown it on Gary Gensler and the SEC, and they sued the SEC. What does that mean? We're going to talk about Bitcoin volatility, what to expect in price. We're going to talk about Visa and their ambitions to get into Web3 and crypto. And we're doing that with a very special co-host that's filling in for Robin, who'll be gone all week. Is my man, Forrest. Let's bring him in. Forrest. What's up, guys? How you doing, brother? Good, good. How about you? Good, man. First and foremost, thank you so much for work, helping us this week and filling in for Robin. Definitely an upgrade. So I uh, look forward to this <laughs> week. And who knows? Maybe a new business deal will come out of it at the end. Uh, just kidding. All jokes aside. Guys, if you're not familiar with Forrest, you already are. Now, Forrest, um, did you practice Robin's intro where he does the old boring stale and he screams all at the top of his lungs like he has Tourette's? No, unfortunately, I didn't. I don't have any intro. Um, Beautiful. You know, kind of, kind of boring. That's <laughs> kind of boring. Boring is good sometimes. All right, Rocco, should I throw one Ola out there? Somebody, somebody's Ola. gonna do some Olas. Olas, Forrest got us to Ola. Bam! That's all we that's need. That's it. That's we all need. we need. All right. So, I'm excited for today, man. I want to start. You know, we got to start with with some funny stuff here. So, of course, we start the show off with with some giggles, and we have this picture here. Please note the post-apocalyptic fiction section has been moved to current affairs. Now, what's your sentiment on what's going on uh, globally? Uh, do you like you know a lot of people are saying you know there's going to be a war, or whatever. Are you uh, are, are you worried at all? And if you are, are you making any adjustments to how you DCA or huddle your crypto? Are you buying more? Are you buying less? Well, what are your kind of thoughts here? Uh, yeah, so, um, look, I mean, a lot of people may not want to put on the tinfoil hat. I'm, you know, half on half off kind of guy where, look, I, I do think that there are powers that be that do control things and influence things behind the scenes more than people really give credit to. Um, obviously I think it's probably a, a headline we'll discuss later, but Tucker Carlson getting fired and then uh, CNN, Don Lemon getting fired, just kind of weird, weird things going on. Yeah. Um, and it just feels like there's this constant political agenda that is being pushed behind every single thing. Every headline is just politically charged and it just feels like this, uh, the, this, this political warfare. But as far as, uh, wars go, uh, do I think there's going to be a war? I think there's a war that's already being fought and I don't necessarily mean, uh, Russia and Ukraine. That's obviously a war that is, you know, being, being fought. But, uh, I, I think World War III is very geopolitical, very, uh, uh, financial um, and uh, just more. I think I think it's already being fought, and I, I think it's being fought in, in a way where there's there's a battle for uh, power, and it's not necessarily going to you know hopefully not come to you know be used using weapons or, and whatnot, but I think people are using, or countries and governments are using uh, currencies and uh, trade embargoes and such as, as uh, weapons against countries. And I think uh, there's, there's already kind of, and you kind of get into this whole thing, you know, meddling with other people's news and media, controlling their government, that, that type of stuff. Again, you throw it on the tinfoil hat, but uh, I absolutely believe that there's, you know, other countries that have an interest in, seeing the United States democracy fall and they're probably working um, to, to do so. So I, I personally think there's already a war going on. Um, it's just uh, kind of happening underneath everybody's noses, noses and it's not necessarily uh, being fought with, with guns and, and missiles. You know, I don't know about you, Forrest, but I feel extremely comfortable uh, if, you know, if the financial war that's happening and the de-dollarization and people moving away from the dollar, even U.S. allies. I feel extremely comfortable knowing that I have a significant amount of investment in the crypto ecosystem, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's Web3 technologies, whether it's layer ones. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you, you share the same sentiment and I'm sure a lot of people watching do as well. Uh, if, if there is this great reset that everyone talks about, you're gonna wanna be in a decentralized type of currency where no government or no political party 
holds, you know, holds any weight either way as far as a control and manipulation of that token. Now you did mention Tucker Carlson. And so we know yesterday he was he was fired. So was Don Lemon. I hear people call him Don Lemon. It's lemon, guys. It's lemon like the fruit, all right? So this is from Cat Turd. I feel something tonight. Tucker Carlson is leaving Fox is a turning point. Do you feel the shift? This is the beginning of the end of mainstream media. I think we can all kind of agree we've been seeing this probably over the last five years slowly as people are cutting their cable, as distrust in mainstream media continues to seep into people. What, l let me ask you this question, Forrest. So obviously the target audience, I mean, we run, we run our YouTube numbers, you run your YouTube numbers, a majority of our audience is between the ages of 25 and 35. And where do those people get their news? Places like Twitter. Is that a net positive for the crypto industry, seeing as all you ever hear on mainstream media when they talk about crypto is uh, crypto is bad, Dogecoin this, they only talk about the negative, never talk about the positive, Bitcoin mining is bad for the environment. Now, if those people who are getting their news from mainstream media, their distrust and maybe, you know, this whole Tucker thing and Don Lemon and, and if this thing continues to unfold, you think that's a net positive for, for our space if a majority of information and news that's consumed is happening on Twitter versus on Fox or CNN or these local cable channels? Yeah, uh, there's a couple of interesting things at play here. So one is like all the credible experts with the rise of social media and the ability to make a living running a YouTube channel, um, running, you know, uh, social media, Instagram, whatever it may, running a podcast, all of these uh, social media outlets have created revenue streams so that people that are actual real experts in the space can go that path. And, and you see more and more people actually go that path where they're building their own brand, building their own YouTube channel, building their own podcast. So that leaves the non-experts or a lower quality demographic of people to cover mainstream news. The other thing is, and, and go through these mainstream media outlets. The other thing about these mainstream media outlets is they have sponsors. They get their money from advertisers, particularly in the, the uh, pharmaceutical industry. It's like, 80 or 90 percent, I believe, of their advertising revenue is, is from the pharmaceutical industry, which is wild. Um, but because of that, the narratives and the things that you're allowed to talk about on these uh, mainstream media outlets is restricted uh, by those advertisers, by what those advertisers want you to say and what don't want you to say. Uh, so you have all these credible experts that say, well, I can just make money running a podcast or a YouTube channel. Why would I be restricted in, in saying, uh, or why would I be, you know, have to follow a specific narrative or hit these exact talking points? I can say what I want to say if I go and, and do things on my own. So I, I think it's just eroded the quality uh, of, of news outlets and Fox News lost another good one. And Tucker Carlson, super popular segment. He's probably going to start a podcast or a YouTube channel. And I would imagine he'll do very, very well. You know, um, I shared a tweet. I'm, I'm, I'm about to pull it up right now. Um, let me find it real quick. So I shared this tweet. I tweeted this yesterday. <clears throat> and where did it go? Here we go. So this, this tweet from uh watcher guru right fox corporation loses 930 million dollars in market cap after Tar tucker carlson left and i don't know about you bro but that is that's insane we're talking a billion dollars for one person's voice and opinion and so you know with elon musk taking over and essentially you know a lot of people's voices whether you agree with it or not they were saying stuff on on Twitter previously. They were getting shadow banned or outright banned. Uh, you know, you, you had new reports of the government and FBI reaching out to Twitter execs to to ban accounts or to ban tweets. And so now, I mean, I think everyone can agree it's more free speech on Twitter. Now, whether you agree with it or not, that's up to you. But I feel like to have a, a platform where everyone can voice their opinion. And you gotta remember it's it's opinion you don't have to you know you can still respect someone if they have a differing opinion and so what is that going to mean for i mean what is that going to mean for content creators and you know elon musk came out uh someone tweeted 
Someone tweeted and asked, uh, at Elon Musk said, will YouTube content creators make more money or make the same money on Twitter? And he said they will make more. And so are we maybe seeing a shift? Everything is going to be on Twitter, like live streams, news. You have the Twitter spaces has been completely blowing up. Um, you know, that's kind of my thing. And, and in my opinion, it's a net positive. I think mainstream media has completely eroded the trust of everyone whether you're on the left or on the right and this is not meant to be a political discussion it's really not but as far as crypto which is politically agnostic it, it doesn't lean one way or another we don't really care if you're a democrat or republican if you believe in crypto and you believe in the ethos of what we believe in you're more than welcome we can give a crap less what you think about anything else politically and so i i think this is a net positive for crypto I think those people that age 25 to 35 were already starting to get a majority of their news sort uh the news from places like twitter and if we can start getting some of those other people in who are still on mainstream media maybe they maybe crypto will you know they'll get more uh exposure to crypto whether it's a single tweet whether it's the price of bitcoin when you type in bitcoin in the uh, search bar and so in my opinion i i definitely think it's a net positive for our space but let me know what you guys think in the chat you think that is a uh, th what we're talking about. You think if people start taking all their news from Twitter instead of mainstream media, is that a positive or negative for the crypto industry? Put a one if you think it's a positive. Put a two if you think it's a negative. All right, let's move on to some other news. So some quick hitters, real quick. So we have this from Whale Chart. Breaking: Russian central bank governor says Russia is ready to give businesses the opportunity to settle foreign trade in Bitcoin and crypto. Forest. Uh, this is pretty big, right? I mean, can you imagine, let's say a, a country wants to buy $2 billion worth of Russian oil, but decides to buy it in Bitcoin? They would have to go out and buy that Bitcoin. I mean, what are your thoughts here? Like, th this is pretty big, and, and I didn't see any news articles on this. It was just a tweet. So, well, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's look, it's the 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 fall of the the petrodollar. We've you know, kind of talked about this uh, off and on for the last couple months. We've seen the signs, and it's it's not surprising to some degree. It's obviously very bullish for Bitcoin and crypto, and that's not to say you know we don't want to support uh, the United States or we want to support Russia, or whatever that. It, it's not politically charged. It's just it's just a fact that the adoption of Bitcoin and crypto is is bullish for. Or Bitcoin and crypto. It's, it's not rocket science. Um, this is a headline that I think would have really sent uh, crypto up in a bull market. Like if we were in a bull market right now and this headline, you know, it came out, I think people like, like people would really, really be looking at, at this as, as a bullish sign. Now, I will say that with these kind of transactions, you, you wonder whether or not it's going to stick in Bitcoin or if there's going to be some uh infrastructure built uh with smart contract functionality and what that ends up looking like and what networks that uses um obviously right you have these these very large deals um you know in, in trade facilitating that in bitcoin versus facilitating that via a smart contract network where you can have the smart contract and have it be trustless uh I, i'm curious to know whether people think that that is, is is something that'll be needed or if just straight up transacting in bitcoin um is is going to be you know popular with with you know large you know uh countries trading uh oil and, and you know different goods i'm curious i don't know if i have an opinion on that or not but obviously uh bitcoin Bitcoin is is being adopted that's uh that's an interesting take are they gonna want the smart contract capabilities and well we know uh there are some projects out there that that are bringing smart contracts to bitcoin you have uh stacks and possibly icp via their bitcoin canisters and so who knows but can we see the end of the petrodollar and the rise of the bit dollar uh then we have this news from from visa Visa partners with Circle to push stablecoin payments. Now, I was a little surprised that Visa decided to partner with a American domiciled stablecoin company with the uncertainty in regulation here in the US. Does this say more about Visa and them? You know, do they know something we don't know as far as 
hey, everything's going to be fine. Circle's not going to get sued or get pushed out of the country. Or they're just like, we don't care. This technology and stable coins, it's, it's so important to what we're trying to do that we're just going to risk it. Well, where do you think the, the, the kind of, where do you land on that? Both. I think, I think most people realize that the right, like, like when it comes to, to, to circle and to USDC and to other large institutions that are actually taking regulation very seriously and doing a really good job, such as Coinbase, that this, this regulatory pressure is fake to some degree. Uh, it, it's real, but it's, it's, it's probably not going to last forever. Eventually, there becomes a resolution, and I, I find it extraordinarily unlikely that Circle and Coinbase get completely pushed out of the picture permanently. Um, the other thing about this is I think Visa's business model, um, they have no choice. I think that they are, if they don't get their, their claws sunk into this market of stable coins, uh, and it develops without them having a grasp on it, their business models add a lot of risk, right? Their business model is to charge transaction fees, um, a lot of times north of 2 to 3% per transaction when you swipe your credit card, and they, they charge that to the the um, uh, the stores. I'm sorry. Uh, the, what is, I'm, I'm completely blanking on the word, the merchant institution. Uh, so they, they charge merchant? that to the, the merchant. Thank you. They, they, they charge that to the merchant. Um, but that business model, when you have like smart contract networks and, and layer twos, like Arbitrum, uh, optimism, even layer ones like Solana, and you've now you've got Solana pay coming out. You've got Cardano where these transaction fees on these networks uh, and, and there's a lot of competition in the space. Block space on, on these decentralized networks is becoming extraordinarily cheap. Yes, Bitcoin and particularly Ethereum, uh, the the layer ones there. Yeah, a Bitcoin transactions like you know between fifty cents and three dollars, depending on the the you know the. the cost. Sometimes it can be cheaper, but it's still kind of expensive. Ethereum's very expensive. You pay $20 for a transaction fee, but all these other solutions out there, block space is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and it's getting less and less expensive to do a transaction, right? So when you have Visa charging 2 to 3%, they're feeling competitive pressures. At least I think they're feeling competitive pressures, and if they don't get their a piece of the pie uh, of USDC payments or stablecoin payments in general, uh, their business model is at risk. I agree. I completely agree. All right, let's move on. Before we move on, we're at uh, 60 likes and 150 viewers. Let's get these likes up, guys. If you like having Forrest here, if you like us streaming, if you like the content, and if you're looking forward to the content, make sure you hit the like button. Want me to welcome some of the new people on the chat? Or want me yeah, to... yeah. Why don't you create a list for me and I'll actually... A list? Uh, okay. Yeah, create a list for me and uh, I'll actually pronounce your names correctly for once, guys. So uh, <laughs> this is why you tune in. All right, let's move on to... Uh, let's take a look at what the markets are doing. And so we're going to swap over here. We're going to take a look at Crypto Rank. I like this because I can uh, format my layout. It's decided to add volatility in here. And of course, we're going to start with Bitcoin up half a percent over the last 24 hours, coming in at 27000 $549. Bitcoin volatility is sitting at 5.6%, just fairly low compared to the rest of the alts in the top 10. And I want to go over this, and we're going to we're gonna get a chart here from Forrest. We didn't do any TA yesterday, but you'll get plenty of TA for the rest of the week. Bitcoin volatility index hits six-week lows despite the looming macro risk events. And it says to watch these key Bitcoin price levels. Uh, Deribit's Bitcoin volatility index just fell to 52, which is its lowest level since the 8th of March. The drop to fresh, uh, the drop to fresh more than, wait, what? The drop to fresh? The drop to fresh more than six week lows comes despite the Bitcoin prices. Okay, wh who wrote this? I am so sorry. The drop comes after six week lows despite B Bitcoin's recent price pullback from 10 month highs it saw last week above 31K. Major U.S. tech behemoths like Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google will also be reporting earnings this week, which could also have a big impact on macro, on the macro sentiment. And uh, the drop in Bitcoin volatility expectations, as represented by the drop in the volatility, suggests that traders or investors view the recent price pullback as making it more likely that the weeks ahead will see consolidation 
And it gives an example between 25 and 30K rather than continue with aggressive pushes higher. Are you seeing anything on the chart as far as, you know, market structure? They did talk about these earnings reports uh, moving into next month. Uh, I believe on May 1st and 2nd or 2nd and 3rd, we have the next FOMC meeting, which they're expecting another 25 basis point rate hike. You have the jobs reports coming out. Um, so volatility is low. Does that mean that we're just going to be chopping sideways? Is there anything on the charts that you're seeing that could say otherwise? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, let me share my screen a little bit. And uh, whoops, there we go. Um, so I think ChatGPT with that one sentence that was chopped up, I think people are these journalists maybe maybe relying on ChatGPT a little bit too much, uh, kind of spazzed out there. Um, yeah, so I kind of want to set the picture of what's happening today. So, you know, Bitcoin's actually flat. It's down $2 today. Uh, it's down 0.01%. So it's flat day over day. A lot, not a lot of volatility. But the S and P 500 is down. It's crashing. It is not looking good out there. And as a result, some of these other risk assets, you know, like you know, broader crypto, not doing great. Down a percent or two. Down three percent here and there. Obviously, you know, some of these, uh, you know, altcoins are not going to like the fact that the S and P 500 is crashing pretty hard today. So the S and P 500 is moving down pretty aggressively into this kind of pivot zone, uh, prior support, prior resistance, um, after we had recently broken through it. The reason this is happening, um, my belief at least is, and I'm pretty sure it's, it's fairly obvious, is First Republic Bank stock is down 43% today. Um, so this is, I, I don't know the story with First Republic right now, um, but it's obviously saw, down and this is- the, the, oh, Just to interject for us, they, they had over a hundred billion dollars in withdrawals in the month of March. A hundred billion dollars gotcha. of money left First Republic Bank. Yeah, so uh, you know more of the same in terms of bank runs and you know potential bank uh, insolvencies and collapses. We saw how Bitcoin reacted to the last one, right? SVB and Sil Silicon Valley Bank and Silvergate. Uh, obviously, there was a, a big, you know, a big spook, a, a large crash. But Bitcoin rebounded on the on the idea that uh, this, you know, that that Bitcoin is alternative to the banking system. Uh, and it begs the question, are we going to see something like that happen again? So I, I'm of the opinion that we're probably about to see some increased volatility. Um, so a couple things here is as long as Bitcoin holds this just kind of range where we're at right now, um, there we go, I pulled up RSI, we've got actually the, the strong potential for bullish divergence to be printed on the RSI. And this is actually uh, more apparent in the Ethereum chart. Um, this is very, you know, this is barely a higher low. The higher low on Ethereum is actually considerably higher. Um, but this is potentially bullish divergence after a very similar pattern to what we saw last bear market cycle. And I, I want to you know, be clear here that this bullish divergence last market cycle is what sent us into the final leg. Uh, this, yeah, this bullish divergence right here on the RSI. And you could have even have, have drawn it, you know, there and there. Uh, but that's what sent us into this last parabolic blow off top leg of an 86% run for Bitcoin. Uh, and yeah, Bitcoin's in a correction right now. Bitcoin's in a in a correction, but again, 18%, 18.3% correction after the in the midst of this bear market rally, this wick down was was 25%. So these 20 to 25% corrections can absolutely happen in a bull market, or I'm sorry, a bear market rally, which I believe we're in. And we're currently sitting at 13, 14%. So yeah, there's a lot of levels that we're paying attention to below us. Um, I'll throw on the long margin pressure levels from our bear market low. And we saw that came in and, and ended up being the resistance that capped our top here at $31,000. We've got the bullish divergence and we've got our previous range high. That's an important level to watch. And we also have 23.2K, which is an important level to watch. Those are the downside targets if we break break further down and you know if, if you know for whatever reason bitcoin breaks down whether the s p 500 is performing poorly or not uh those are our targets but there is the the general trend is is still upwards and we are printing bullish divergence in a bullish trend so people need to be very aware that bitcoin could actually perform well here again you just saw the headline russia russia potentially accepting bitcoin 
um, Visa partnering with a, a blockchain company. These are all very, very bullish headlines for crypto. You, you've got the, the narrative starting to kick in here with, with Bitcoin and, and gold being correlated. You look at the gold chart and, and gold's looking phenomenal. Um, and, and, you know, as people, as banks go under and inflation continues to be a problem, people are looking towards solutions like Bitcoin and gold. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, we're in a correction here, but there's there's potential more potentially more volatility to come um, and, and potentially to the upside. We just need to be uh, ready for both scenarios. Look, if we crash here down to these levels, 23.2K or 25K, I'm of the opinion those are important levels to actually be buying more uh, crypto at. So uh, I'm, I'm a, a buy the dip person in this uptrend. So long as we're trending upwards, um, the dips are, are meant to be purchased. If we see a change in market structure, where we come back up and we make, let me draw this, uh, this will be the last thing. If we actually see a, a change in market structure where we come back up and we fail to retake these these levels, right, that turns into your deviation, that's your head and shoulders, right, uh, then yeah, we'll, we'll look to short, we'll look for lower targets, but uh, right now we're still very much in a bullish trend. Boris, before you move out of that chart, uh, we had a couple super chats. First one from Biomex499 said, Crypto Billy says, hola and adios from 30,000 feet in the air on his way to consensus. His arms are tired. Love Sin City Crypto. Hit that like. Yes. Also, Crit Cats. $5 super chat said, Forrest, what is your opinion on the CME gap at 20,300? Do you see that being filled? And I know gaps are, are more prone to be filled than, you know, in my uh, experience trading in the traditional stock market and options. Those gaps typically always get filled. Uh, crypto, I don't know. Uh, what are your thoughts on that CME gap at twenty thousand three hundred? Do you see that being filled? Is that is that something that that needs to happen? And maybe from your experience, does it is it often that that happens that those gaps get filled? Yeah, so um, I'm of the opinion that it doesn't have to be filled. And so we're getting such a similar pattern to what we had last uh, going into the last bull market. Um, look, is there, a, is there a pretty decent likelihood it gets filled? Yeah, sure. But we also already spent a ridiculous amount of time and volume down at 20K. Uh, and we recently went and retested that level already. So I'm of the opinion that it doesn't necessarily, it's not something that I weigh heavily on my analysis. And in the last uh, bull market cycle, I believe the gap, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, and, and I could be wrong here, I believe the gap was around uh, like 10K or so. And everybody thought we were going to come right back down to, to fill this eventually. And we never did. We never came back down to fill it and we went all the way to $69,000, never filled that, you know, 10K gap. And then all of a sudden, as soon as Bitcoin starts coming back down to, to you know, fourteen, fifteen thousand $15,000, people are like, oh, remember that $10,000 gap? We're going to go fill it. And then it rips up to $30,000. I'm of the opinion that gaps get filled just by a happenstance, right? When a gap, when, when a gap happens right and you know if it's at 20,300 right the it, it's highly likely to get filled because that's where there was a lot of volatility and a lot of price action and at any given point you know you, you go up a little bit you come back down and then it gets filled right and just gaps get filled naturally but we've had a huge huge move here for bitcoin so i'm not of the opinion that that the gap has to get filled i think that gaps get filled mostly just be based on happenstance you look at this you know, you look at this range, right? And it wouldn't be too crazy for us. That's a terrible drawing of the range. It wouldn't be too crazy for us to come back down to, to fill it and come back and retest the bottom of the range. But that doesn't necessarily mean that we have to, especially if we, uh, you know, we break out of the top of this range or we could come back to fill it at a much later date, right? So, you know, we've got this range and we could break out of the top of this range, bear market rally to, you know, 30, 40, or I'm sorry, 40 to $50,000. And then we could get our recession in Q3. Later on this year, we get a recession and that could bring, you know, crypto and risk assets back down to, to fill this, this gap down here. So it's completely possible, but I'm not of the opinion that gaps just absolutely have to be filled, especially in, in crypto. We've seen examples where they haven't been. I agree. I think it's obvious. I think it's definitely more likely in the traditional markets, but in crypto, I don't think it's a, it's like a prerequisite, so to say. Uh, for us, real quick, before I move on and look, take a look at some alts, we've seen a 12 year Bitcoin wallet become active, a 10 year Bitcoin wallet become active. We've seen a wallet that participated in 
Ethereum's ICO, the article said 7.7 years ago. So a little over seven and a half years ago. That started moving some ether. Um, a lot of people are worried. They're saying, uh, I'm hearing rumors swirling that a, a, a code's been cracked and some of these people's wallets are being taken over, hacked, so to say. Others are saying, hey, these longtime holders now, they might know something. Are you are you uh, nervous at all? Or is this just part of bear market and, you know, wallets coming to life? Uh, yeah, I, look, I'm not a I'm not an encryption expert, um, but I, I don't believe it's likely that uh, SHA-256 or whatever the hashing algorithm that yeah. Bitcoin and Ethereum use um, are, has just been broken and it's only targeting really dormant wallets it, it just it just seems very bizarre i don't think that's the likely case at all i think it's more likely that uh you know for example you had a guy out of actually georgia that got uh, that um uh got arrested for and he had like tons and tons of bitcoin he had found a a, a hack on the uh, Silk Road website where it allowed him to double withdraw Bitcoin, right? So you have all these like old stories of or, or people that have been in the space for a really long time, and you've got governments going after people's, you know, going after large wallets, seizing Bitcoin. Um, you, you've got, I, I think it's just a, a natural occurrence. I mean, people are uh potentially just you know checking in on their bitcoin making sure everything's all good potentially you know looking to sell right and they could be looking to sell and a, a lot of these old dormant wallets are from a an era where there there was no altcoin market so if you've, you're sitting on a huge amount of bitcoin um you may have a thesis that is that just, you know uh, Ethereum outperforms Bitcoin for the coming, you know, five years or the next two years. You may have a, you may be very bullish on an altcoin that did not exist five, six, seven, eight years ago when you originally bought that Bitcoin. Uh, you may think that you, that Bitcoin's performed extraordinarily well, but now it's time to diversify a little bit outside of Bitcoin. It makes completely logical sense. Look, if I was sitting on fifty million dollars worth of Bitcoin, I certainly wouldn't keep. $50 million, if it, I wouldn't keep 100% of my portfolio in Bitcoin. I would look to diversify. So I don't necessarily think that, you know, look, if you're sitting on $50 million of Bitcoin, I don't think it's that person just wakes up one day and decides to sell all $50 million of that, that Bitcoin. I think that's just, that would be very bizarre and very weird. Um, so I don't think it's encryption. I don't necessarily, I don't think it's encryption, encryption being cracked. And I also don't think it's, you know, whales waking up and just deciding randomly to dump Bitcoin that they've held for, for, you know, five, six, seven, eight years. I agree. And I think you bring up an interesting point is, uh, you know, back in those days, there were no alts. It was like Litecoin and Doge pretty much, I guess, in 2013. And then ETH came in 2014. But you're right. These people, it doesn't mean that if a wallet becomes active, they're looking to dump it. Maybe they're just looking to diversify like four cents. I want to take a quick intermission to welcome some of our new people. Rocco, you have the list for me? Beautiful. So a huge shout out to some of the members that, and a lot of you I know have probably already been in here before, but I'm going to say your name correctly. Anthony Ailman, Web3 and me, Ogly, Randy, Colin McDonald, Brian Naval, Zhao Mello, Jesse Oro, Orange Whoa. Bloods 21, Ivan Hernandez, Lazarus, S-Dog, JP Trees, Crypto Hands. Where's Crypto Neck, by the way? We had Crypto Neck in here. We had Crypto Leg. We had Crypto, crypto Waste. Crypto Muscle, too. Crypto Muscle. Yeah, where, where are all the body parts at? Uh, Wise Tree <laughs> and Crypt Outcast to all of you. Hola! I hate doing this. So terrible. I, I I can't tell you. And and Forrest knows because he was there with me. Robin, I think, has Ola Tourette's. Everywhere <laughs> he goes, we're we're talking to the waitress at this restaurant. Hola! She's like looking at him like, what are you doing, dude? Anyways, <laughs> let's take a look at what some altcoins are doing. <laughs> let's take a look at what some altcoins are doing. So we got the crypto bublets uh, pulled up here. So this is on the daily. Some of the biggest losers, we have XRD. So uh, I know I've said this, I say this on every show, but I'm gonna say it again. Uh, it's a layer one DeFi, very intriguing to me. I'm uh, doing some more depth research. I think I'm gonna do a video on this one. Uh, if you guys want me to do a video on XRD and why a layer one DeFi is so important, put a one in the chat. I shall abide by the result of this poll. Also in the red, we have Zillica and Pancake Swap. Forrest, we know PancakeSwap just did their V3, uh, and I believe that was to, to be EVM compatible or cross-chain with Ethereum. Are you hearing any news as, as to why PancakeSwap is dipping? And if we take a look at the week, 
Uh, it's down 25%. Over the month, it's down 28%. So one of the biggest losers over the last month, is there anything you're hearing or seeing in regards to pancake swap? Uh, maybe there's a reason why this, this thing is tanking so hard? Uh, I'm not hearing a lot of things about pan pancake swap. Um, not much interest in it from the circles that I personally run in. Um, and that goes for most of Binance Smart Chain. Um, Look, I don't know exactly what the fully diluted metrics are. I can actually look those up really quickly so we can see, you know, is it something that has you know, a high degree of inflation? There could have been just something changed. Yeah, I mean, look, it's circulating supply is 194 million out of 750 million uh, max supply. So you're oh, wow. talking about less than 30% circulating so that's going to lead to pretty high emissions and a lot of these dex coins i'm not very bullish on um, because most of them are just simply governance tokens they don't actually spit out any revenue for you right. uh and they're just you used you know the emissions are used to incentivize you know liquidity so you have like this whole mercenary liquidity deal where it's, it's the same thing we're seeing with all these nft exchanges right now uh, where there's just a ton of competition in the decentralized exchange space. Throwing up a decentralized exchange is extraordinarily simple. You can just copy Uniswap's code and tweak it for whatever EVM compatible chain that you're on. And there's just tons of competition and it's, you know, it's incentivized by, you know, these high emission tokens. So um, while I'm, you know, I, I think DeFi will continue to grow and expand the current model of a lot of these DeFi tokens, especially the early DeFi tokens. It's just not very sustainable. So um, you know, just not a huge fan in the long term. John Foster uh, said um, yield went down after the update. So, you know, oh, as you mentioned, you it's it's more of a governance token. And if there's really no incentive for you to hold the token and you're not getting yield, then why would you hold it? Um, Red man, really? What does EVM stand for? You don't think Forest knows what EVM stands for? I don't even know what EVM stands for. Just kidding. It's Ethereum virtual machine. Anyway, some of the biggest gainers of the day. We have Injective Protocol. Litecoin is up 2.2%. Uh, we're not going to get in depth of this, but Litecoin is, uh, they're having their halving in August. So what could that mean for the price of Bitcoin as we get closer to the Litecoin halving? We'll discuss more of that in detail. And then Caspa and Chili's is also up for the day. As far as the crypto fear and greed index, we're coming in at a neutral 53. Now, Forrest, you're in a lot of different Discord groups and alpha groups, whether it's NFTs or crypto in general. Is it does this chart reflect the sentiment that you're seeing from actual people in the space? Um, no, what I would actually say is it is a mix of the two extremes um, on in, in you know some of the groups I'm in and and you know on my timeline on Twitter it's you've got a lot of people that are maximum bearish and you've got a lot of people that are like we're going to 40k Bitcoin um, and 53 seems like a pretty reasonable average between the two of those things I think the market is this over the last year I think the market has never been more confused um, yeah. you have you have a completely horrible looking macroeconomic situation. Uh, recession looks extraordinarily likely. Yield curve is all screwed up and it's been screwed up for a very long time. That's usually terrible for risk assets. And we know that crypto is a risk asset. On the other hand, you just have the sheer uh, adoption curve of crypto that is, you know, maybe brute forcing and offsetting a lot of that. People, more and more people are getting interested in crypto, especially as these banks are going down and having issues. Um, we know that the, the technology is just growing at an exponential rate. So you have those two kind of underlying ideas. You have the people that are pay attention to the macro and you have the people that are paying attention to the technology. The technology is very bullish. The macro is very bearish. And, uh, this seems like a, a pretty logical, you know, average of the two. I think the, there's just uh, kind of opposing viewpoints right now. And I, and I asked you that because I think it's important for, you know, not, not just to read what based off of tweets and this and that, but from actual people, especially if you're, you know, if you're in those communities, you're in those discords, you're in those telegram chats, whatever the case may be, I think that's extremely important. Forrest, I'm going to ask you for one more chart before we move on to some news. I'm going to ask you for ETH. Um, we've seen a lot of staked ETH being withdrawn, but we've seen on certain days an equal amount being deposited. Now, I also want to mention to people, just because staked ETH is withdrawn from the contract does not mean that they are looking to sell it. But ETH did retrace. It got up to almost, uh, well, did get up to $2,100. Retraced. Are we at a good support level for ETH? 
And if not, where is that extremely strong support level where buyers are willing to step in and purchase ETH and, and maybe kind of share that or share, share that with us? Yeah, so, okay, let's first, you know, look at the ETH chart and trading view here. So we had our margin pressure levels off of the swing low. We did get a deviation above our 2050 level. We went up all the way up to around 2150. But we've now come back down to this, look at this this range here, this 4X. Actually, let me just uh, draw it like this so it'll be easier to, to visualize with these white lines here. You see this prior range that we were in off of this initial bounce, we held resistance. It was resistance on the way up. We broke through it, held resistance again, held as support. We broke through, tapped it as support, continued to move on to our top here. Uh, now we're holding this level once again, and this was you know prior resistance. Now we're currently holding it as support. Meanwhile, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we'll go. We'll, we'll throw off the long margin pressure levels, and we'll actually remove these as well. Uh, we actually see that we're in a situation where we may be printing bullish divergence. If Ethereum can get a bid here, if, if it can defend right this 1824 level or so and actually start bouncing, we confirm bullish divergence. We recover the 50 uh, 50 level on RSI, which is a really important level to, to hold. And all of a sudden, we could very well uh, move right back up. This is also a scenario where you could just see, and I'll zoom into to the four hour, um, you know, oh, Starting to see a little bounce here on the four hour, very nice. Um, so this this bullish divergence again coming in on the four hour, which is setting up for that bounce uh, and bullish divergence on the daily. Uh, what we could see this happen here is even in a more bearish scenario, look at how far ETH has come down, right? This has been a very volatile or very, uh, very sudden correction, 15, 16%. Uh, we could see this kind of just a normal correction and then continuation of the shorter term downtrend. And there's there's your head and shoulders kind of scenario. So even in the short term here, I'm pretty bullish on the idea of going back up the retest 1900 and change, 1920. Um, but if we start, if this turns into a larger bounce and we can recover that level, then all of a sudden we've got, you know, you know, the previous high in play. We've also got, you know, again, that margin pressure level that we deviated above that was at around 20 50 or so. So we have that as a key level to look out for in terms of resistance. Uh, and we can absolutely go higher. Like I said, we looked at the previous bear market rally and that bullish divergence printed and it sent us into our last parabolic leg of the bear market rally. And those targets for Ethereum could be as high as $27, $2,800. Uh, and for Bitcoin could be as high as you know, 37 38 40 uh, so yeah, I, I know I'm kind of you know talking about both scenarios here, uh, but yeah, uh, short term looking fairly bullish, like we're going to get a bounce. Uh, if you're looking for a correction, there's quite a few levels to keep in mind. I'll throw on the short margin pressure levels from our most recent high, and that's going to show us where the where the shorts have to kind of surrender their positions a little bit. Uh, and you're going to see a ton of support around 1600. And in the scenario that we go back down to to you know, uh, the 1400 and 1430, there's a ton of support between 1400 and 1440. There's also a ton of support in this range at around 1350. Um, but I don't think we're going back down to 1350. Um, I would expect some support, uh, 1600 to 1700. The last thing I'll show is this Ethereum. I'll rerun this on high block capital. Uh, this liquidations heat map, we see a huge support level, very, very dark support level at around 1680, 1690, 1700. So uh, mm -hmm. if we do uh, we do see a little pullback, it could very well just be to the 1700 level, which is this range, resistance and range support. No, uh... Redman said 1450 would be a heck of a buy. I think even 16, 1700 bucks would be a great buy for ETH as well. And then one last thing I want to share, and then we'll move on to some of the biggest news. And I'm just going to read this headline. But I want you guys to understand. I want you guys to understand, you know, when stuff hits the fan, when it comes to monetary policy and, and currency debasement, people seem to be flocking to Bitcoin. Bitcoin's got a $35,000 premium in Argentina. I'll leave it at that. All right, let's move on to some of the biggest news of the day. By the way, guys, if you haven't hit the like button, make sure to hit the like button and uh, support the channel. Now, this bomb was dropped yesterday. This is from Coinbase's chief legal person, officer, or whatever you want to call him. 
I'm going to make it bigger. There we go. From Paul Grewal said, Today we filed a narrow action in the U.S. Circuit City Court to compel the SEC to respond yes or no to a rulemaking petition we filed with them last July asking them to provide regulatory guidance for the crypto industry. Uh, this tweet goes on to say the SEC is required by law to respond to petitions within a reasonable time, but they have not yet responded to our petition from last July, which is why we filed our action in court today. It's obvious there's a lack of clarity among our regulators regarding crypto, as even the chair of the SEC has declined to say which crypto assets are securities. It kind of shows a clip of Gary Gensler, uh, his hearing. The crypto industry and its users need clear laws and rules to follow that are built for a new technology. Enforcement actions based in inapplicable securities laws aren't the answer. Now, there is a, I forget what the name of it was, but there is a law that says if, uh, if something like this happens, then they have to, by law, respond. And so Coinbase simply said, will you give us some clarity and tell us what's a security and what's a commodity? It's a yes or no. And SEC hasn't responded. And so the route they've taken is they're suing the SEC based on that one law regulation, which it's, it's kind of going over my head here, guys. So if you remember what it's called, it's like APA or uh, something administrative, something, something. Anyways, um, Forrest, do you think, like, is this the only way, you know, is to, to, to play their game, to sue them? We can't sit down. We can't depend on our our Congress to pass legislation. We can't depend on Gary Gensler to do the right thing or give us some clarity. Do we have to play the court game? And is this the right way to go? Are you bullish on this? What are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I think, uh, you know, whether you, you, you know, people support centralized exchanges, Coinbase or not, whatever. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of this. I think that, uh, it, I, I I like the fact that they're going, uh, they're punching back uh, to some degree, and yeah, I think this is this is good because even if they, even if it doesn't lead to any resolution, it raises the stakes for the SEC and it draws attention where the SEC doesn't necessarily want attention drawn to. So uh, I think this is great. Um, you know, not a lot else to say about it. I, I'm not yeah. a, a lawyer. I don't know how this will you know resolve. Uh, if at all, but I do like that it's drawing attention. It's building a case. Um, it's building the case for Coinbase that they are doing everything in their power to to comply with regulations. They just they're asking for guidance. They're 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 like they're asking for help. So uh, it makes it harder to to you know punish them uh, in the future, um, or you know makes it in the eyes of a judge. I would imagine that this makes uh, a stronger case uh, for Coinbase. It makes Coinbase a lot more likable. In the eyes of a judge i agree and and to kind of uh to your point you know whether you're for crypto uh, central exchanges or not uh this is a fight for just crypto in the us whether you don't use central exchanges you only use decentralized exchanges decentralized wallets or DeFi, whatever the case may be like this is, seems to be our only way is to take it in front of a judge and be like we've done this 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 and this the SEC is supposed to do this. They haven't done it. So can you force them, essentially, to do something? And so their goal with this and everything I've read, and I've read their whole blog post and everything, is they want the judge to make Gary Gensler and the SEC say yes or no. Are you going to give clarity or not? If they say yes, great. We're going to hold their feet to the fire. Give us some clarity. If they say no, now they can take that to court again. Now they have ammunition. We know Coinbase will serve with a Wells notice. We possibly a lawsuit coming down the pipeline. And if Coinbase has that in their back pocket, that the SEC said no, right? They said, no, we're not going to give clarity. Whatever the reason is, I think that's going to help them and their case. And that's going to help everyone in the crypto industry as a whole. Uh, so I think there's a net positive. We need companies like this. You know, we have Ripple and what they're doing. If we got Coinbase and maybe some of these other U.S. crypto exchanges hop on board like Gemini, you know, people that operate here, Kraken, KuCoin, whatever the case may be, if we get them all the band together, let's pull all the resources together and let's once and for all get some clarity in the space, right? And I've said this before. If your stance is everything is a security, then come out and say it. Say everything is a security, right? So that way people know how to navigate. Uh, and so, you know, I've heard 
people like Chamath Palahaptia, or however you say his, uh, his last name, saying crypto is dead in the U.S. The problem with that is that crypto, uh, that the U.S. is the largest financial market in the world. And so there is, there, there is no way with this, with that big of a void, if, if crypto companies do decide to leave the U.S., with that big of a void that'll be left with these companies leaving, that there's not going to be a company that comes in and decides to find a way to, to maneuver or find a way to make it happen here in the U.S. There is too much money at play and there is too much market share to gain because when the tides turn, whether that's a new SEC chairperson, whether that's a new presidency, whether that's a new Congress, you're, you're going to want to be entrenched in the U.S. economy when it comes to crypto because, again, crypto is, or sorry, U.S. economy is the number one market, financial market in the world. And then we have this from the Daily Huddle. Coinbase's Brian Armstrong says Congress needs to step in now that the SEC has caused untold harm to U.S. investors. Brian Armstrong believes that the legislative branch of the government needs to step in and stop the SEC from driving the digital asset industry out of the country. Coinbase recently met with the SEC to push for a rule book that offers regulatory clarity for crypto players in the U.S. Now, this happened, this happened, right? The meeting happened before Coinbase filed the lawsuit. Uh, Brian Armstrong said, met with the SEC today, we'll continue pushing for a clear rule book in the U.S. for crypto regulation. The U.S. can't afford to fall behind on this important technology to update the financial system. Also important for regulators to set policy and then enforce it. Not start with enforcement before there are clear rules. At this point, seems like Congress will need to step in. Uh, and, then, uh, and then we have this. And I'll kind of group all this together. This is from Coindesk. So it's Patrick McHenry, McHenry, who is the chair of the House Over Financial Oversight Committee. And this is him answering a question about Gary Gensler's leadership and uh, kind of what he's done. And so let's take a look at what he had to say. It Obviously, it seems to me that uh, Chairman Gen Gensler wasn't quite clear with you. Is that, you, you that's a fair cat categorization of it, that uh, he, he's not being clear with his plans to regulate crypto and specifically with Ether? Well, what he exposed is, uh, publicly is what he's been set doing privately. Uh, this whole thing, come on in and talk to me. Um, and then, uh, and then he, he goes after anyone who comes in and talks to them. Uh, goes after them with legal proceedings. Um, so th this, is, this, this just belies the absurdity of, this, uh, of his leadership, the Securities Exchange Commission. He could provide clarity. He could provide uh, consumer protection, and yet he presided over the biggest loss of, uh, of consumer investments um, with the crypto fallout over, over the last two years. And he's not, not done a damn thing to make things better. In fact, he's made things worse uh, and made uh, legitimate actors and uh, taken the legitimate actors and pushed them out of the, the sphere and allowed illicit actors to run rampant. It is the opposite of consumer protection. It's the opposite of safety and sound. It's this opposite of capital formation. It is a, a terrible regime. Um, and what he exposed in two minutes with, with answering my questions is how bad this is is that he can't even clarify one uh, one uh, piece of technology that's been long existent and provide some level of thinking around his approach to digital assets. He won't do any of that. So Congress will act. We're going to step in. We're going to clarify this. And it's my hope that it'll be a, a bipartisan vote and that we're going to be able to make law here over uh, his dithering and over his uh, uh, over his bad approach uh, to consumer protection, safety and soundness, and capital formation. It, I so, Forrest, do you agree with the lack of regulatory clarity has caused harm to U.S. investors? Yeah, definitely. I mean, look, th there's they're just they're so far behind and they're they're putting themselves even further behind and Gary Gensler is putting themselves even further behind. I'm still of the opinion that they're trying to buy time because they believe crypto is a, uh, a systemic risk to the, the current financial and monetary order of things. Uh, and the powers that be do not want to lose power. Um, so yes, I, I believe that, I believe that Gary Gensler is, is has been given a, uh, 
an MO, right, a, a goal to slow down crypto. Uh, and the result of that has been harmful to, to investors. I mean, he was working with FTX directly closely. Um, and if he couldn't sniff that out, then that's, that's a huge issue. Yeah. And, um, you know, would the Terra Luna, the Celsius, the FTX, the Voyager, would, could those have all been sidestep and we, you know we wouldn't have people sitting here with thousands of dollars some even millions of dollars locked into these exchanges and being dragged through bankruptcy court if there were some clear rules and regulations for centralized exchanges to where if my brother or forest cousin or whoever doesn't understand crypto doesn't know what a decentralized wallet is is afraid of all the steps it's it's not practical for someone to come in and be like, all right, now I got to move this to this exchange. I got to write the seed phrase down. Like people don't want to deal with that. People want ease of use. I mean, if you guys haven't figured that out yet, it's everywhere, whether it's in financial markets, regular markets, buying a couch, buying anything, it doesn't matter. And so for me, it's if we had certain exchanges where you know they're, they're properly regulated and they have certain guidelines, like you can't commingle funds. I don't think anyone has an issue with that, right? Customer funds should be separated with personal exchange funds, whether you're trading with them or whatever the case may be. And if you're rehypothecating, there has to be some sort of fail safes involved. Now, could that have saved people billions of dollars? Oh God. Seriously? We pull that up, Rocco. Yeah, let me see if you can Oh do my it. God. Uh so we just got breaking news. Uh man, if you're a Voyager, if you're a Voyager holder, guys, I am so sorry. This is this is getting ridiculous. So Rocco is showing me a tweet here from Will, uh, Watcher Guru. Uh, I, I can actually pull this up on my end, Rocco. Right here, right here. I oh, got perfect. it. Perfect. Uh, Binance terminates the deal to acquire Voyager's assets. Like, what is going on? What the hell is going on here? They put in their bid, and then the government said no. The judge, the SEC's like, hold up, wait a minute. Judge said no, it can proceed. And then it was again ready to proceed, and so everyone got excited again. And then the DOJ steps in and they halt it. And then Binance agrees or Voyager agrees to take a clause out of the contract. And then DOJ is like, all right, fine. And everyone on the Voyager end, the creditors who have money on there are like, yay. And then now we have this. So this is a game that's being played. And, and it upsets me that we have people like Gary Gensler, people in our Congress saying, we care about the average American person. We care about investor. We care about investor protection. And then it's just roadblock after roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. Forrest, what are your thoughts on, on this breaking news? It kind of ties in with our discussion as far as the regulatory landscape of what's going on in the U.S. Oh, I mean, where, where do you even begin? Um, look, I mean, it, it all comes back to, it, it's like, the first domino that really fell was, was Terra Luna, right? And Terra Luna, could have been avoided if there were was regulation in the space. Um, and part of me, part of me wants to to say, hey, look, we, we, you know, people should be able to buy whatever they want. But when there's just like straight up blatant Ponzi schemes um, that are masqueraded by you know a, a blockchain technology and and you know high yields, um, th there becomes a point where we do need some some regulation to to protect consumers and you have all of these you had all of these funds like you had celsius and blockfi and, and voyager that were basically just running like uh unregistered hedge funds with people's deposits you know promising yields and then going around and degenning it all into terra luna and then when terra luna went bust they all they all went bust so it all just comes back to this idea of you know we needed some some sort of regulation in the space to avoid this and it's uh uh, I would like to see the the parties that um, that that are guilty. You know, Mashinsky and Do Kwan, You know, be brought to justice. I know uh, Do Kwan was recently captured, but uh, yeah. As far as why Binance backed out of this specific deal, I'm I'm uncertain as to why that was. I don't real. I don't know why uh, the government got involved and and wanted it to, to to slow it down, and the DOJ got involved and wanted to slow it down. But it uh, seems like it should be something that should should go through pretty easily if it's just the acquisition of assets, right? I'll tell you why, and I'll tell you exactly why. Because this, there was a a clause in the contract Voyager had 
has said that it would protect him from further and uh, any lawsuit from the U.S. government moving forward and or relating to the past. And so the DOJ didn't want that in there, and Voyager agreed to take that out of there, and so the DA, DOJ gave him the green light and said, fine, and now we have this. Of course, guys, big shout-out to Matt Enos in there. Uh, he's the one who, who uh, put that in the chat. Rocco went ahead and pulled it up. Uh, and so we don't have reasons as to why this happened but we know what happened and so if you got vo money locked on voyager guys i am so sorry you got to go through all this bs because our our government here in the u.s and our politicians can't get their act together i want to give a quick shout out to jimmy jimmy gifted 10 sin city crypto memberships if you are the lucky recipient of a membership uh we do have some members only videos and now you have access to all of our really cool emojis that robin created uh, all right, let's move on to a state that I once loved and now despise. And that state is California. California lawmaker introduces a bill to incorporate DAOs. Hmm, to incorporate DAOs. A California lawmaker, Matt Haney, has introduced Assembly Bill 1229, which seeks to re-engineer and expand the state's corporate to include decentralized autonomous organizations, also known as DAOs. This bill, if passed, will enable DAOs, blockchain networks, and smart contracts to register as businesses in the state. So DAOs, blockchain network, and smart contracts. So three, we'll be able to register as a corporation in the state. I can't think of uh, a better way to make a, you know, DeFi legit than a register like a regular business would uh the ability to file taxes and be compliant with other state and federal regulations is something they're also looking to enable as well and this is a quote from the assembly member the person uh, matt haney said our goal is to educate our colleagues on blockchain basics california corporations and the workings of DAOs. by establishing a legal framework around DAOs, we can create certainty legitimize this organizational type and ensure appropriate taxation in California. I think that is where the answer lies, my friends, is ensure appropriate taxation in California. We know there's been a mass exodus of, of people leaving California due to people just don't like living there anymore, whether it's political views, whatever the case may be. So there's a big budget shortfall when it comes to taxes this year, and it's massive. And so for me, why in the world would a DAO want to come in and register why? So they can now get sued? We saw what happened months ago when there was a, a, a couple instances of DAOs being sued and they're summoned, subpoenaed and summoned to court. No one shows up. Well, because it's a decentralized autonomous organization. There is not one person who's a CEO. You don't have, oh, I'm the CEO of this DAO. No, it, it goes based off how many tokens you have in your voting power. Forrest, is this, a, is this as bad of an idea as I think it is? Is there any part of this where you can turn to and be like, oh, okay, I can see how that can help the space moving forward or, or DAOs? No, this is, this is uh, upside down, backwards, doesn't make any sense because if you're a DAO and then you register with the government, you're not, and you're not a DAO. You're not decentralized. You're not a you're DAO. Thank you. You're just like, you're, like you're, is, you, you cease to be a DAO. You probably have to register someone as the CEO and then all of a sudden, or, you know, the person that gets sued if, if you break a law or don't pay taxes. Do uh, this is, yeah, this is, uh, it's ridiculous. It, it makes no sense. Just start a regular uh, business and don't go with the DAO model uh, if you're going to register with the state. Um, so, yeah, I mean, just, I, I think you'll see a bunch of, DAOs that are in you just won't see anyone register as a DAO in California like if they pass this which is fine I mean they'll just go to different states they'll go to different countries whatever whatever it may be but um yeah it makes absolutely no sense I'm really intrigued by the fact that Andreessen Horowitz said Andreessen Horowitz or A16Z yep. which is a large venture fund in the space was backing this bill so yep. um that is I'm, I'm, I'd be really curious to to understand why they view this as a positive well, I think it has to do with, you know, VCs and institutions, I guess, want, want a stamp of approval from regulators, right? Like, if we're going to dump a I'd, crap I'd, ton I'd, of I'd money be. into something, we want to know that that company's not, the project is not just going to get wiped off the face of the earth. But this is the dumbest thing. I'm just like, they're, they're packaging it up in a, in a fun and sexy way, as Robin says on his intro, that, oh, we're trying to teach people. And, you know, you can 
Enjoy the benefits of being incorporated in California. There are no benefits to being incorporated in California. Why? So I can pay a 11% tax to the state? I think this is dumb. Right. Uh, and, and I don't know, man. Uh, this is their idea of, oh, we're going to pass legislation and California's the most tech forward state. No, you're not. Yeah, I know Robin supports the bill. If Robin was here, we'd be having a heated argument right now. All right, let's move on. Let's move on to Visa. Robin, just leave us alone, man. Visa is hiring engineers for, quote, ambitious crypto product roadmap. Visa is hiring software engineers for its crypto division as it develops new products aimed at the space. We have an ambitious crypto product roadmap at Visa and just open a few requirements or a uh, uh, few recs for uh, senior software engineers to help us drive mainstream adoption of public blockchain networks and stablecoin payments, said Koi Sheffield, the head of crypto at Visa. Company is looking for experience in building highly available and scalable backend systems and passion for Web3 technologies. Uh, they talked about uh, in this article, it talks about how other Web3 and or crypto focused companies are having layoffs like Coinbase, like Disney, like MoonPay. But uh, Visa is actually hiring. Uh, understanding of layer one and layer two solutions and experience writing smart contracts. This was interesting to me. Using Solidity are recommended. Well, Forrest, what is the one giant layer one that uses solidity? Ethereum. Ethereum. Uh, I showed, I showed a article yesterday of all the different companies in Europe that are using blockchain technology. A lot of them were banks and they all had one thing in common. And that one thing was Ethereum. Has it, is, is Ethereum the, the chosen chain the chosen layer one for traditional companies and tradfi to move their way into web3 yeah I, th I think so um and that's just because of everything that's been built thus far has been built on evm the ethereum virtual machine right uh, obviously ethereum's major drawback is that you know block space is limited and very expensive the transactions are, are quite expensive but the solution to that right now which is not to be honest is it's not the most robust and and, and the best long-term solution in my opinion uh but it's just outsourcing that to other chains other layer two so you got polygon optimism arbitrum uh, all all chains where block spaces and transactions are considerably cheaper uh but they revert back to using ethereum security model and consensus model so um yeah look these, this is just extraordinarily bullish for, for the long term. Um, I think what you're going to see happen is once we get through all this macroeconomic turmoil, um, recession, whatever it is, there's going to come a day when the S&P 500 makes a new all-time high uh, and goes to $5,000. All of a sudden, people are going to look up and they're going to say, oh, we're in a macro bull market again in, in legacy. Where's crypto at the moment? And they're going to look at all the head and they're going to realize, oh, I can, I, I'm using stable, I'm using USDC on my phone and I'm tapping the payment to pay for my groceries and I'm, it's all working. Oh, I'm using Bitcoin or I'm using uh, Ethereum or using Solano crypto to, to pay my bills. All of a sudden you're going to wake up and realize that the, the next bull market's here because crypto is here and it's in, in, integrated into everything you use in the, in the day. And it's going to happen fast. I think it'll happen in the next two to three years. Uh, and once we get through this macro macroeconomic downturn and, and legacy downturn, people are going to wake up and be like, oh, it's the bull market again. Um, and I think right now people are really worried about the, the short term in the next six to 12 months, as people should be. Uh, and they're ignoring the fact that the groundwork is being laid for, for the next bull market and for mass adoption. Um, and, and that's a good, that, that's a good point. And, you know, we, we showed the tweet with Visa and stable coins. They know like Visa, MasterCard, these payment infrastructure rails, these, these payment companies, they know we're, we're shifting away from the SWIFT system and we're shifting into the new web three tech, uh, the age of web three and, and stable coin payments and payments over blockchain. And so what could this mean for Ethereum? I see Medina said Visa gonna run ETH nodes. If you're gonna if, if you're gonna build a new infrastructure of your business on something like Ethereum, wouldn't you wanna have some say in proposals? Wouldn't you wanna have some exposure to the token and the ecosystem itself? Could this drive Ethereum's price to 
maybe 10 20 thousand at the height of the next bull market i think it's definitely possible uh but i think eth still in my opinion from what it could possibly be has a very long way to go uh and you know i know you're bullish on eth i'm pretty bullish on eth the only thing that kind of worries me about eth is is i do think it's definitely become more centralized as it's moved the proof of stake and the whole i think the number was 60 percent of nodes were ofac compliant i think if we go down that road of nodes of of ofac stepping in and saying nope this wallet is uh blacklisted this wallet is blacklisted and we get up to the 80 90 of nodes that will not verify that transaction i think that's a slippery slope and at that point i think we would be going backwards because again crypto does not care the color of your skin the political affiliation or how much money you have as long as that money is in your account they will transfer it for you all right we have, uh, uh, we have 291 people in here thing. go ahead Forrest. go ahead oh my bad. no please so one more interesting thing on this is uh visa partnering with circle uh yep. circle with usdc circle has a very close and tight relationship with coinbase who is building a layer two network known as base which mm. is again evm compatible so uh this in my opinion in, in despite all of the regulatory issues long term is pretty bullish for coinbase and probably coinbase stock i 100 percent agree and we know kathy speaking of coinbase stock kathy wood bought another 60 some million dollars of coinbase stock so interesting um now there's there's 293 of you in here. If you're new here, if you're new to the channel, say hello. We'd love to personally welcome you to our community. Also, make sure to hit the like button. Now, Forrest, I want to read this article and I want to share your amazing tweet thread about your journey down the meme coin path. You were giving us updates on the hour. Oh my God, a good correction. Nope, it's not a bad correction. But first, first, and we did do a poll. So make sure if you're watching, if you're in the chat, Make sure you cast your vote for the poll and we'll end it here and we'll talk about it. So we have this. Ethereum DEXs attract most traders since 2021 as meme coin popularity soars. The source from the block. I'm going to make this a little bigger here. So we have Ethereum-based decentralized exchanges witnessed a significant surge in trading activity last week as meme coins gained traction among crypto enthusiasts. On April 19th, the number unique uh, the number of unique traders on Ethereum DEXs hit 72,000, a level not seen since the end of 2021. And uh talks about the meme coin frenzy, of course, led by none other than Pepe the Frog. A spectacular price increase made people rush into meme coins like Pepe, Wojak, and Chad, all having a daily volume of 10 to 100 million dollars. This is uh, from Simon... Kosar, director of data at the block. Now, Forrest, I'm going to share your tweet here. Uh, you tweeted, pretty sure I just burned 200 on a 30K market cap meme coin, up 2X. And you asked if you should sell or go to sleep. And then you share that you're up 6X. Then you shared healthy correction. And then you shared not so healthy correction, which I don't know why that's not pulling up. But can you maybe speak to, um, you know, first and foremost, we, we had this meme coin surge. Do you think meme coin the meme coin boom is is over is it a net positive or negative for the space and what's your experience if you are going to invest in meme coins maybe share some of the experiences you had as far as you know the the pros the cons what to look out for maybe kind of share that with our community and people watching yeah so okay a uh, lot to unpack there so kind of uh, we'll circle back around to like uh, these questions all right so um meme coin experience i saw a tweet so, so uh, a a meme coin called i uh what was it um gensler oh gensler was the okay. gensler was a popular meme coin and then i saw a tweet about another meme coin launching called pelosi and i was like okay this will probably run so i go over to uh dex tools and i look at the most recent uh pelosi meme coin that was created i, I bought 200 dollars worth and at this point it's, it's pretty much like putting uh putting your money in a, in a slot machine um there is a little bit as i was kind of uh figuring this stuff out a little bit you know, there's some some analytics and uh, to some degree a little bit of technical analysis not a lot that can be applied so you can i, I believe develop an, an edge if you're going to be trading these meme coins um but yeah it, it's more about trying to guess which ones are going to get a little bit of a spark and give you the opportunity to sell it at two three four five x and there's some 
skill involved, though it's primarily gambling. Um, so I ended up selling, riding that one all the way up to, uh, I believe, a 8X, 8 or 10X, um, and then riding it all the way back down. I sold it uh, before I went to bed for a whopping $75 profit. So I got out with $275 from it. Um, hmm. So didn't lose my money. Uh, I was happy, but I also didn't make a 10 X. I didn't make the, the $2,000 that I, I, I could have if I had a sold. Um, and then the next day I uh, saw that Tucker Carlson was fired. So I waited all day with the, uh, the listings of new meme coins pulled you just, up. And you're, I just you just went full for, DJ, bro. Huh? You just literally yeah, went full yeah, DJ. Yeah, I just went full DJ. I was like, I got 275 bucks. <laughs> uh, where do I, where do I spend this? Um, and I was waiting, waiting for the, cause again, there's, there's some, it's, it's a little bit of a game, right? You see, you see the news and then, you know, people are going to invest in Tucker. So I was like within the first, you know, three people to buy the Tucker, uh, Carlson meme coin, uh, ended up riding that up to two or three, four X. But by this time the meme coin narrative is really shifted. There's, you know, it's really diluted meme coins popping up every couple of seconds, just way too much supply. Um, people are not, you know, people keep losing money. There's like MEV bots that are pulling a ton of Ethereum out of the entire system. Um, so it's a, a net negative, um, but ended up getting out of Tucker for uh, Tucker Carlson coin for like another hundred dollar profit or something like that. So it, just little, little degen um, action. Do I think the meme coin, uh narrative is healthy for the space no because these meme coin creators just rug the projects uh once they get up to you know a certain market cap and they're pulling 30 40 ethereum out of every meme coin that catches on um so that means that the investors are basically on average losing a ton of money um so they're basically the casino in this in this event and then you have these investors that are losing a ton of money and that's money that could have gone into ethereum or bitcoin into more solid investments that prop up the price for everybody else um, the other thing is you have these MEV bots that are just sucking money out. So MEV bot is just a, um, minor extractable value. Essentially what it means is they're just, uh, whenever you send a transaction through, there's, there's like slippage and you're not getting the exact quoted price because your order is affecting the order book a little bit. Um, whenever there's a, a large gap or there's a lot of slippage, uh, an MEV bot can come in and basically front run your transaction and sell it to you at a higher price. Um, so they're, you know, extracting a ton of Ethereum from the, from the system every single day. So uh, the one thing that it does show, and this will be my final point, is it does show that there is degenerate um, spe uh, appetite for speculation. So a lot of people believe that meme coins are a top signal. I do believe that um, it, it is demonstrating that people have money that they're willing to gamble with um, and a lot of it. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we saw that to a mass scale in 2020 when all these stimulus checks were being handed out. You know, people were getting 1400 bucks and they started paying the child tax credit every month instead of at the end of the year. And people saw it as an opportunity. You hear headlines, oh, Dogecoin millionaire. This guy bought Shiba Inu uh, for 500 bucks and now it's $5 million. But guys, don't fall into that trap. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to share that with you guys. And because of someone, you know, I, I don't do that. I don't have time, you know, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with doing that. Forrest made some money, but it's important to share firsthand experience and to understand it's your money. You make it spend it how you want, but just understand that, you know, it went from a 10 X down to a two X down to a rug pull in a matter of potentially one hour, two hours, three hours, whatever the case may be. Now, Forrest. I want to move on to more stable token. And this is the gold standard for oracles. And we're talking about Chainlink. So a couple things I want to talk about. And I want you to share some of the information that we spoke about in person in Atlanta about Chainlink and why you're so bullish. And I would love to take a look at a Chainlink chart as well. I recently picked up some Chainlink a few days ago uh, around $7. And I think it was 20 cents, something like that. Anyways. Decentralized exchange GMX connects to Chainlink's low latency oracles following a community vote. Arbitrum based decentralized exchange GMX, which for us, if I'm not mistaken, you have dabbled in as well, uh, will connect yeah. to chain, right? Yeah. Which uh, will connect to Chainlink's low latency pricing oracles, which are designed to feed price data faster than regular oracles. At press time, more than 96% of community votes approved this integration. 
the low latency oracles will bring the industry one step closer to the performance level that currently exists outside of it while our economic alignment helps set the foundation for a more sustainable ecosystem said johan aid eid uh the president of go to market at chainlink labs and then we have this silo blockchain joins chainlink scale program and i'm pretty sure this is what you were talking about um so what are your thoughts on on this on chainlink continuing to evolve i think everyone understands that oracles are the backbone of smart contracts smart contracts cannot run without an oracle right they need that information to execute whatever the parameters of the smart contract is like saying hey i want to drive a car but there's no engine what are your thoughts on this news and what are your thoughts on on chain link moving into the next bull market and do you have any like price targets that you're looking at maybe start taking some money out of chain link if it does i don't know is it 100 bucks is it 300 dollars? what are your thoughts and maybe talk about the scale program yeah, so this program essentially uh, allows uh, extra benefits for uh, Chainlink customers, which are usually businesses and projects that are using their oracles, um, in exchange for five per three to five percent of their token supply. Um, so they give their, you know, the, these in this build program, they give you know, these projects come in, they give three to five percent of their token supply to Chainlink stakers. Uh, and those are given out over time. I don't believe those rewards have started yet. So when you when you own Chainlink and you stake Chainlink, which only I believe a small portion of people can ha have staked Chainlink at this point because it's locked. Once they unlock that and more people can can uh, stake their Chainlink, um, I think that'll be very positive for Chainlink because it'll lock a lot of the circulating supply of Chainlink up uh, and make it less liquid, uh, more more prone to price appreciation. Uh, but then you're also going to be earning a lot of these low caps. So one of the things that a lot of people do in a bull market is they get too, spread too thin. They try to invest in the next big thing. The next, they try to capture a, a 10x, 100x opportunity, investing in uh, a, a low cap cryptocurrency. And they look at their portfolio and they realize I've got 50 low cap cryptocurrencies and half of them are have gone down to zero and you can't even afford the dex fees to get out of them because you know the exchange fees are so high so what Chainlink is essentially going to to be acting as is uh, an index fund or a composite for a, a lot of these low cap low cap cryptocurrencies so you'll have you know 25 30, i think there's already 25 or so uh but eventually you may have a hundred low cap projects that are in this build program that have taken three to five percent of their token supply and given it to chain link stakers and you're going to be earning those those cryptocurrencies those low caps as a chain link staker uh so you're essentially getting an etf or, or uh an index fund of low cap cryptocurrencies whilst holding a blue chip uh, infrastructure play, which is chain link token. So uh, you're getting the best of both worlds. And if you just want exposure to the growth of the crypto ecosystem uh, as a whole, I think Chainlink is going to be a phenomenal play. As far as specific price targets, well, we can cross that bridge when we get there. Uh, I'll be paying attention to where the easy bands are, but I think uh, Chainlink is one that could just absolutely go ballistic and reprice overnight once they open up staking and w once we're in a bull market and a lot of these low cap coins in their build program are 5, 10 xing in, in a bull market scenario. Um, are you okay? So if, if, if I'm trying to FOMO into Chainlink, what, what are some good levels to, uh, to look at maybe uh some support levels what are we seeing here on the uh, on the charts you got one pulled up yeah as far as chain link as long as your time horizon is uh two years um or at least two years if you're willing to hold chain link for for the next two years it, anywhere right here where we're currently at in this lot like it, we've been in this range um, below nine dollars and fifty cents for three hundred and seventy five days now um, that is creating a very very strong sideways support region and you know, could we dip below and take the lows sure could we go another step down in a recession sorry for this sure. can you please just uh, show, show the oh, if yep. you can toggle off yeah absolutely uh, my apologies so um, chain link sitting in the sideways range for three hundred and seventy five days 
over a year. Um, this is extraordinarily strong support, and it makes it very unlikely that we do go below the lows. However, if we do, it's fine. It's chain link. It's, it's a solid cryptocurrency. You're going to be earning staking rewards from a lot of low cap cryptocurrencies. Um, my belief is that this is just going to end up skyrocketing back upwards um, in the next bull market. So, um, in, as far as accumulation goes, I'm uh, I'm fine uh, as long as your time frame is two years. Um, buying anywhere in this region, anywhere anywhere below ten bucks, anywhere below nine bucks, ideally. And we're currently sitting at seven dollars. Um, I've been adding to my chain link bags. I'll just be holding on to it, and I think it's going to be one of those things that could potentially do like a. Um, you know, uh, this might be a little bit of, of an extreme circumstance, but you saw where Binance coin was, you know, going sideways for a long term, slow, long term accumulation. And all of a sudden, Binance Smart Chain launched, right? And you just had this huge repricing to another level and was valued way higher. Um, so if you're if you're patient with Chainlink, um, again, I'm, I'm not saying it's going to it's going to, you know, 50 X overnight, but I do think you could get a really rapid price appreciation once the broader market realizes that they're getting exposure to all of these low caps. And when you're in a market scenario where you're in a bull market and these low caps are 5 Xing, 10 Xing um, and, and going up in value. So this the coins that you're earning are of higher value, um, then you potentially have a, a, a situation where everybody wants to pile into Chainlink as a crypto ETF or a crypto index fund. Are you worried about inflation? You know, I'm taking a look here. We got out of a total of a billion max supply, we only have 517 million circulating. So you're looking at a little over a 50% ratio. Um, I don't have the exact vet, uh, vesting schedule or unlock pulled up, but from what you know, uh, is token inflation something you're worried about with Chainlink? Let's say it does start catching steam and staking and everything, and all of a sudden, do we have to, or, you know, should we be worried about a bunch of these tokens start flooding the market? Uh, yes and no. 50% or 51% circulating supply is not super ideal, but also if you're staking your Chainlink, you're the one earning those emissions. Right, and I don't know what portion of those emissions are set aside for staking. I think it's the vast majority of them. I'd have to go and look. But again, if you are if you're staking your Chainlink, you're earning these other low cap cryptocurrencies, but you're also earning more Chainlink tokens. I believe it's like four point seven five percent or so. Um, so that's going to offset the emissions. So that makes it that that encourages staking. So if you're just holding Chainlink and not staking it once they open staking to everybody, then yeah, you're going to probably you know lose some value because you're not going to be earning all these tokens. Uh, but it just makes it incentivizes people to to stake the chain link that they do own, and that can drive the circulating supply way, way, way down in terms of everybody locking up their tokens uh, and they're not for sale. So you could have a very high ratio of staked uh, versus circulating. Uh, token. So it's something to be aware of, but it's not something that I'm uh, terribly concerned of. It's also very different than 15 to 20% circulating. 51% is, it, it's again, it's not ideal, but it's also you're not going to have, you know, if you have a 10% circulating supply, you're looking at 10x inflation. Um, whereas you're looking at less than 2x inflation on, on Chainlink. So once you get past that 50% mark, it's not as bad as when you're sitting at 10, 10 to 15, 20% circulating supply like a lot of these uh, layer twos uh, are sitting at right now. And, and plus, you know, with Chainlink, you, you know and understand the importance of the utility it serves. And so... I think the state, I mean, we haven't seen it play through as far as price movement and whatnot, but I think the staking thing is going to be big. The scale program as well. Again, guys, Chainlink is the gold standard for what a smart contract needs to run. Um, it's like the most important part of a smart contract. And you're going to want the company, right? The, that information that's being fed into the smart contracts for the smart contract to be able to execute the provisions that are in said smart contract. You can't just go out and, uh, and hire a rinky dink, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. You want a company, you want a project, you want Chainlink that has a proven track record. They've been around the space. They have the largest ecosystem when it comes to their space. Um, and so, you know, someone, I think it was, uh, who was in here? Redman said something about being boring. Hey, man, is it going to make me money? And is not going to lose me a crap load of money or going to go to zero? Then, then you know, something I'm interested in. Uh, all right, that'll do it for the show today. 
Guys, if you're not already subscribed to Forrest Channel, Sistine Research, do yourselves a favor. If you like what you heard today, if you want more, he does do live TA every single day at a, a, a 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. 10 p.m. Eastern Time most nights. 7 Pacific. Um, and also go subscribe to his YouTube channel. And also throw us a follow on Twitter. We're currently sitting at 4420. So four. 420 uh twitter followers also subscribe uh, go follow forest on twitter as well at zero zero huge or sorry zero zero forest and so make sure to do that also guys follow us on all the other social medias go check out our merch store or you got anything to say before we move on or before we sign off Ah, uh, no that covered it i i appreciate you having me on uh, it's a pleasure to call host looking forward to the rest of this week hope Amen everyone enjoyed the stream Amen to that, brother. We will have Forrest all week. So if you enjoy the content, make sure to come back. If you're not subscribed to our channel, subscribe, hit the notification bell. And with that being said, Rocco, can we get it right this time? Got the outro music playing? Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. It's been an absolute pleasure on behalf of myself, Forrest, and Rocco. We love you guys. Thanks for an amazing show. We will see you back tomorrow. Same place, same time. Until then, peace. peace.